gentlemen, Jack Hanna. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I guess it's not raining out there. It's a beautiful day today. You having fun at SeaWorld? Yeah. Are you having fun at SeaWorld? Yeah. That's not done. I tried to sign some autographs here earlier, uh, also at a breakfast this morning, but I'll be down in front here after the show and I'll try and do as many as I can. But real quickly, if you can't get an autograph, you have children there, all you have to do is email me at info at jackhanna.com. Pretty easy, info at jackhanna.com. And I'll spend hours a week signing these things. I'll pay the postage and plus you can probably read your name. <laughs> but I'll be more than happy to do that here as long as I can for about a 45 minute period after that. Uh, a lot of you know me from, from whether it be Good Morning America, Letterman, all the fun shows and fun things I do, but obviously there's issues that I get very serious about. I'm a, I, you can ask my wife. No, my wife's here. They're not ask her. <laughs> I forgot she's here. Uh, I'm, I'm a, a real happy, fun person about 99.9% .9 of the time. That's just who Jack Hanna is. It's what you see on TV. It's what I am here, by the way. But obviously recently we've seen some things on the television about SeaWorld and some of the things here with whales, that type of thing. And folks, let me tell you something. In 1973, I came to this park when it opened with two little girls. I happened to be, had the fortunate experience to help start the Central Florida Zoo, which was a Sanford Zoo. I had three employees. I was only 22 years old. I, I'm from Tennessee, everybody. I never even seen a whale. I mean, I didn't even see a cow. I lived on a farm. So I didn't know what whales were by any means. But I'll never forget the first time I came here with my girls, who were only five and seven at that time, and got to see the most magnificent thing I've ever seen in the world. And that was the killer whale and other animals and dolphins that were here. And I'll never forget that, as well as the 350 to 400 million people that have been to them, just the SeaWorld parks, not Bush Gardens, it, since the opening of these parks 40, 50 years ago. So that's what this is all about. And I, I'm going to do this now because I've asked the family. Dawn that lost her life here was a friend of mine. I did the memorial service here at uh, SeaWorld for her. Her, parent, or her family is here today. I will not have them stand up there in these front two rows here. Came to visit SeaWorld and to see SeaWorld because they love SeaWorld. Don loves SeaWorld. Don's life was SeaWorld. The whales were her life, all right? And things happen in life. There's only one person that knows why it happens, and that's the man up there. But I can tell you something. Yes, she gave her life for what she believed in, and so did my friend Steve Irwin and some other people when things happen. But I'll never forget Don and her family and her mother, what was said. I can't go into this because I know you came to see a beautiful show today, which you're going to see. But let me, if we could, that would mean a lot to me if we'd all literally give a round of applause for that family and for what they've done and what SeaWorld has done over the last 40 years, because they deserve it. by SeaWorld. Now you're going to say to yourself, these aren't the typical animals rescued by SeaWorld or Bush Gardens or the entire company, but these two animals are animals that were rescued. And these are animals that are miniature horses. Now you can see I'm just trying to tell these folks what I'm doing here. Here they come. These are little miniature horses. Now a lot of you may think this is terrible, but you have to understand what's happening a lot to animals, not just in Florida, but throughout this country. These little animals are rescued a while back. You remember when the economy failed, everyone, right? You know the, how the economy fell down the tubes? Uh, you obviously did six or eight years ago. Guess what was happening to some horses down in the Dane County area? This is not pleasant, but you need to understand. By the way, the SPCA, by the way, those folks are here that represent the Humane Society. Where are they? Stand up here today. These are the folks who know what's going on. These folks are in charge of the animals that are right? They're here because they know what SeaWorld does. Back then, everyone, you know what folks did? They didn't have the money, they had a horse. They would tie them up in the Everglades. Can you imagine that? Because you had a burial fee. I won't go into what happened to those horses afterwards because there's children here. So that's what this park does. That's just one minor example. And these are two results of it right here. These are miniature horses. All I know is that they're full grown. I know I can't ride one, <laughs> but I do know that I've seen horses like this in Mongo or in, uh, in Tibet where the horses are very small. When I was up in the Himalayas, they're at about 15,000 feet. And they were riding little horses like this, not this exact species of horse, but they're neat little creatures, they really are. And people sometimes do have something beautiful like this as a pet. I try to explain to people, whether you have a fish, 
a dog, a gerbil, a turtle, a, a horse, a pig, whatever it might be. These animals are living creatures, everybody, and it teaches us several things for young people. It teaches responsibility. It teaches the most important word we have here today, and that's love. If you can't love something, you can't save something. And that's what you're going to learn here today at SeaWorld. Be educated and love these creatures because that's what's going to save them. So thank you so much for bringing out two animals here, everyone, that really means a lot to a lot of us that you help save those creatures because they look like show horses right now. I don't know if they are or not, but they sure are groomed that way because my horse in Tennessee didn't look too good as far as grooming. <laughs> thank you so much, ladies, for coming out today for SeaWorld. This next animal, remember that's my cue, everybody, okay? But remember back there that this is the first show you're going to witness today, and then the third and fourth show will be a lot better. The next animal, hello back there. Oh, here we are. Here we are. This is the noose hat on the market. Look what this gets on the screen here. We'll stand right here. Now, what this is, everybody, you see up here, I'm going to turn this way, there we go. This, everyone, is a little owl monkey. I'll do this one first. Now, why do they, if you can, he's turning back, but they can't see. If you can see there, there we go. That's an owl monkey from Central and South America. Now, a lot of these animals come mostly from, by the way, 98% of our animals here at SeaWorld, the 221 zoos in our country, about 98% of these animals come from other zoos and aquariums in the world, not from the wild. Not many people realize that. You don't hear that about that, do you? Because if I need an owl monkey, or if I need a cheetah, or I need a giraffe from Africa or somewhere in South America or wherever you want to go throughout the world, I don't have to go. I go with my veterinarian. I can go and get the, uh, the sperm or the egg from the animal or vice versa. We can take the animals back. Thanks to Bush, real quickly, thanks to Bush Gardens and the Columbus Zoo and 20 other zoos in the country, the bongo antelope was, went into extinction on Mount Kenya, all right? But the zoo world brought them into our parks about 30 years ago. Guess where the end, when they went extinct about uh, 12 years ago? We sent 40 of them back from our zoos, and now they're back on Mount Kenya. And I can give you example after example. So that's how we work in our park system today. So this animal is an owl monkey. It's nocturnal. If you look at those little eyes, you'll understand what I'm talking about. You hardly, at all my filming in the Amazon in Central South America, I've never seen, I'm sorry, I've seen one of them. That's all. You can imagine at nighttime, unless you get the little eyeballs with the lights, you're never going to find the animal. That tail is not a prehensile tail. In a little bit, I'm going to show you an animal that has a prehensile tail, which means it's his fifth hand. This animal does like to eat a lot of insects. It will eat fruits and berries, that type of thing. And I'm sorry to say they were used for the pet trade, which has now been stopped. I'm not talking about the illegal pet trade, but the pet trade where they were sold in places around the world. That's the owl monkey. And this focus now, if we can bring this one over here, if we went right here to the center. This, look, this one here is a beautiful little creature. Now we see this on the screen there. This looks like Elvis Presley with a hair. hair. <laughs> um, Anyway, that is the cotton top tamarind. And again, the same type of tail, not prehensile. And this tail is like, weighs nothing. This animal, by the way, along with these two over here, I'll tell you about these in a second. Well, these animals have babies. And I, this is one that has uh, 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 twins or triplets, or is it those over there, maybe? Yeah, they have twins. And they're the size of your little fingernail when they're born. Can you imagine that? Sometimes they'll have triplets. It's very difficult for them to live. I've only seen this animal, uh, you have the, 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 also the golden line tamarind, like those there, but the, the, the marmosets are down in a, mostly southern South America, Brazil, in that area of the world. They do live in large families. That tail is a beautiful tail. On these animals, you can see their very large tail there that also is not a prehensile tail. And they're pollinators. They're very important to nature because they eat seeds and fruits. They go tree to tree. And when they sleep at nights, it's almost the same thing these animals over here. They get into big old bunches, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, a lot of times in daytime they try to stick together because they're very good food for a lot of animals. So he's trying to stick together with 50 to 100 at a time, which means that that's protection for him. He just went to the bathroom too. So anyway, that's a beautiful animal. Let's have a round of applause for our beautiful hot and hot These right here, these are the tamarins right here. I'm gonna let you talk about the tamarins just a second because I'm not a tamarind specialist. Well, these are actually common marmosets, Jack. <laughs> actually very similar to the tamarins. They're kind of like their cousins. Although the tamarins are found in Colombia, these guys are found in Brazil. And they are very similar. They like to spend all their time high up in the trees. And they actually have special teeth that allow them to chew through the bark of the tree. And uh, they like to eat lots of tree sap. So they spend a lot of their time just hanging out on the trees and chewing the bark and eating the sap. 
And these were very much used for the pet industry years and years ago. And again, everyone, I'm not against pet shops. There are a lot of great pet shops in our country where your children can understand what I just said before, how to love and care for creatures. And that's why it's very important, but not with these creatures here. They can bite your finger off. Plus, they, most of these primates, a lot of them carry diseases. So you gotta be very careful about that if somebody said they're cute little monkeys. So thank you so much for bringing out with Joe Slavin here with SeaWorld Pets Ahoy. Thank you so much. This right here, you're a special audience today. We, we, we did this because we want this to be a special show here today. Aww. What the cats you're going to see today, we've never had here before. I think we've had one snow leopard here in the 25 years I've done speeches here. Look at that animal. Wait till that gets on the screen. I'm going to show you something, everyone, that has to be the most spectacular cats in the entire world. Isn't that magnificent? You're looking at a snow leopard, everyone. There's only been one person or one crew, really, that's ever done justice to this, and that was, how many of you have seen Planet Earth? So, I'm sure you have, a lot of you. If you haven't, try and get that series. It's not that expensive. They're the only ones in the world that got the film of Snow Leopard from, like, beginning, they stayed there for six months just to try to find the family, just to try and find out what, they're, what, they, what they consume, where they live, and that type of thing. This animal here, that coat, I wish each and every one of you could touch this coat. It's not like a tiger or a lion or a cheetah or a leopard or a jaguar. This coat is like silk. It's just like silk. Look at the feet of this cat. This cat gets to be about 125 to 150 pounds. That's the only cat in the world with fur on the bottom of their feet. That cat, when he's full grown, has eyes that are absolutely blue piercing. It is one of the most magnificent animals in the world. Every animal is magnificent, okay? But obviously, having seen a lot of them, and I love all of them, but this is something when they're full grown, well, even now, for example, uh, what they look like there. The cat, it's all, you see the tail? If you look at the tail of that cat, I'm gonna see if on the screen here, you see the tail there a second? Let's see if we can find the tail there a second. You see that tail? That tail, folks, gets to be over four feet long. That tail gets as big as my calf. That tail saves this animal. For example, what do you do when you go out in the cold and you put something around your neck or your body, right? That cat takes his tail at 30 to 40, 50 below zero in the Himalayas at 5, 15,000 feet and puts it around him. It's his jacket. Without that tail, this animal wouldn't survive. If you look at the ears of this cat, you'll notice the ears are very uh, small, right? You, a lot of animals in, in the nature have frostbite and lose their ears because of temperatures like that. That's not the case with this cat. The cat also has a leaping ability of up to 30 to 40 feet. Just like the, the longest leaping cat they say in the world is our mountain lion in our country. But this animal here, every time I see it, it's amazing. Now, I'm not a, a, a person that is a doomsday person, okay? This cat has a lot of problems now, obviously. They think, I don't know what it was, Brian, is it about, some people say a thousand left in a while. That, that to me, though, we, we were real, the Bengal tiger, real quickly, the Bengal tiger, three years ago, we thought there were over 5,000. Exxon, the old company, did research, spent millions of dollars. They came back last year. There are not 5,000 Bengal tigers in India. You know how many there left? This was last year, by the way, less than 1,400. So no one can tell me there's a, a, a thousand left. There might not be 300 left. But I want you to see this, the zoological world again, Bush Gardens, these parks will be responsible for these kids and these kids to see this and maybe someday they can go back out there. And I really believe they will someday. So thank you for bringing that. This is really an exciting moment for us to have a snow leopard here. Beautiful. <laughs> they're a solitary cat, by the way. They're a solitary cat. One of the few social cats would be the African lion, by the way. So I know that. <laughs> I don't know what brought this thing in here. If you bite me, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, you know, I don't mind ending my career, but not with a warthog. Anyway, this thing here, it, we can come up here. Come here, what's his name? Randall. How about Porky or something? This, you know, like, I can't believe how nice you are. Look at that warthog, you right? You know, the warthog, someone said that the warthog was built with leftover parts. The good Lord had leftover parts to build a warthog. You know something? Look at the warts on his face. Look at those warts. This is really a neat thing you've got here, folks, to see this up close. Those warts protect him when the males will fight or when he might get in a fight with something else that has tusks. Now, I say tusks. Right now, his teeth are not out there yet. He has these teeth that come out like this, everyone. And I want to tell you, in the wild, they're like knives. These teeth can take anything apart. Now, the warthog is the favorite prey of lions, leopards, and cats like that. But you know something? If they don't know what they're doing, the warthog will win. I've actually seen hyenas, who by the way, the warthog digs his little holes, you know? The hyenas love to go with those holes and hide. I saw, but soon I saw, we were filming three or four years ago, I don't remember where we were, Botswana or whatever. And here's this warthog down in his hole. He comes out, the hyena tries to go in, and he won. 
he, the war dog, the, uh, the hyena was going to mess with him. But you see the teeth they're coming out there. That, those are the ones that can get very, very sharp. They also have a little tail back there on the rear end there. The tail is not, it's like an antenna almost. I don't even turn him around there. Not that I want to show you his bottom, but I'm just going to show you his tail here. You see that little tail there? That tail is very important. When we're filming in the wild, and let's say we're filming something over here like zebra, all of a sudden I see a warthog that throws that tail up in the air like this. I know, I know 90% of the time, you know what's there? Predators are there. And they, they're the ones how we can follow the predator. We know lions are coming, there's a leopard nearby. And that warns all the other animals, like giraffe are so tall, they see everything, but the warthog is incredible, the senses of hearing. People say that pigs are dumb. Pigs are not dumb, everybody. They're very bright animals. It's amazing. I'm not saying you're a pig, I know you're a warthog, but still. But also, one last thing, they spend about 60% of their life is on their knees. 60% of their life, they have to get on the knees, eat roots and all kinds of things. They can walk for a mile on their knees. And that's what they do in nature when we're filming them. They're always on their knees eating something. And that's why they, that one split second, that one split second for that animal to come up that ground off his knees, is that's when that, I saw the cat needs, is that one split second. So that's why they are a, a, a food source for the, a lot of animals in Africa. Thank you so much for making uh, uh, Porky, or Randall? Who's Randall? I don't know, somebody named Randall got named after a hog, so that's nice. They had a rabbit named after me named Jack Rabbit, so I'm proud. <laughs> this right here is a homo sapien. Just had to be my daughter Julie, by the way. You might have seen her on some of our shows. It's of the Columbus Zoo and helps with all the animals up there. She gets to travel sometimes. And we'll go ahead and the camera right behind you, Julie. We're going to show this. This, everybody, is a palm civet. Now, some of you are saying, well, we'll get it up there on the screen here in a second. You're saying to yourself, what, what is a palm civet? We'll turn around, Julie, to wear it in the light there. Why don't you come right out here where we get right in the light and you see something. There, there, that's perfect. Now turn around backwards here. I'm trying to see his face there. That's Toddy, the palm civet. You say right like that. And the palm civet, everyone, is in the uh, mongoose family. This animal has been known to take down cobras. You saw, I think, a snake video. Some of you were here earlier. A king cobra, one drop of venom, can kill an elephant. A king cobra. They love to eat snakes. They also eat fruits and things like that. Uh, the fur is very, very fine again, like a chinchilla almost. This tail again is, is a prehensile tail. That tail helps the animal get sit upside down, get in a bird's nest, snake's nest, whatever it might be. And they're from Asia. It's called the, the, the palm civet. There's also an African palm civet that's much greater. How many of you adults remember the SARS disease about uh, 10 or 15 years ago that killed a lot of people in China, as well as I don't know how many people in Toronto in less than two weeks? This is the animal that caught, not this animal, this species of animal is a delicacy in Asia, all right? It was $200 at a restaurant. That now has stopped, obviously, because of what happened with SARS. They tried to eliminate most all these animals. That didn't work. They never will. This animal is found in jungles of Malaysia. That when I film there, you cannot go from, you can't even have to enter a flashlight when you walk in there. It's unbelievable. But this animal, I've never filmed him in the wild because that'd be stupid. I never would find one in the wild. But they also used their uh, sink glands, used to for perfume back in the 1930s. And how did they kill a cobra, real quickly? The cobra's here on the ground, right? You saw the cobra in that video, some of you did, right? A cobra, everyone strikes like this. A cobra has a methodical, a predictable strike. It's fast, but you know where it's gonna go. And so does this animal. A rattlesnake will hit you three times before you even know it. They can jump out, you know, like uh, two or three feet to get you. But they hit you three times before you can even move. This cobra follows motion. And that's what you're seeing there with that man in front of him following his hands and his motion. So this animal knows to come down out of his tree and walk around the cobra, okay? He walks safe enough distance where he can't get struck. And so the cobra is going like this and can't reach him. And so he starts walking. The cobra's going like this, following him like that. All of a sudden, that animal, nature's amazing. That animal starts running around the cobra. And the cobra goes like this. And then the cobra gets so dizzy, he falls over, he bites the cobra's head off. I mean, it's funny, but it's not funny for the cobra. It's, it's an amazing thing what nature does again. This is Toddy. We've had him 12 years. He's just... Again, I have a lot of favorites. We love Toddy. Thank you, Julie, for bringing that out. We love the Beautiful. <laughs> Toddy, lo Toddy loves to travel. He really does. Well, this animal here scared my pants off about, I don't know, 20 years ago on my first filming trip to Australia. Now, how would that bird scare me? I just gave it away. You all know what that is? A kookaburra, right? But when you hear a kookaburra in the bushes of Australia at nighttime at 2 in the morning, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to wake up. Now, I don't know if it's going to work. Let's just see. Oh, I think 
we need uh, everybody to get involved. Yeah. All right, you guys are all going to call with me. Okay, you guys got it? Can, can you think you can make that noise? Here we go, everybody, all at once. One, two, three. <laughs> Obviously, you see these at Bush Gardens. Oh, nice. Cheetah. Wow. So I want you to look close, everybody. That's the world's fastest land mammal. Get these cameras focused, we'll show you here. So you look at a cheetah, the world's fastest land mammal. Go to Bush Gardens. If you have, how many of you been to Bush Gardens and the cheetah, cheetah run? That's great. Well, you know how many parks do that? About four in the country do that. Have what they call the cheetah run. And again, you wonder about Bush Gardens. They were the first ones to build the African Belt in this country. In Columbus, we modeled our new African Belt, which is one of the largest in the country. We opened up in May, and we came to Bush Gardens to look what they did for the last 50 years. They had the cheetah run there. Now, we want you to see, understand as you go down there, as you will at Columbus, but you go to Bush Gardens and see how the cheetah runs. Brian and our folks, all about her, all the Whitney, Julie, all these folks, work very hard. We have one of the largest collections of cheetahs in the world. We breed the cheetahs at a place called the Wilds. Bush Gardens, all of us work together. When you go home today, and you're on uh, I-4 out here, I don't know what the speed limit is, but don't break it. If you're going 65 miles an hour, this is the only way I can explain this guy to you all. If you go 65 miles an hour, a cheetah will pass you in, in a while. Try it someday, look out the window. It's amazing, and that's the only way I can compare it when I see them film. When we film the cheetah in the wild, it takes us three cameras, not one, not two, but three. You know what? Half the time we don't even get the shot, because it lasts, it's like a bullet. The cheetah, if you look at his face there, you will notice the cheetah is buffalo filming from an elephant. You know, a big 2,000 pound water buffalo? It took less than like 20 seconds. It was over, it's like a bomb going off. The cheetah's not that way. She knows that when animals are out there eating grass and stuff, they don't think they're gonna be hunted. At nighttime, what the zebra and all the animals in Powell, all those gazelles, what do they do? They get in big herds of 100 to two, 300. They know that they have protection that way. But the cheetah's out there watching. Plus, she's one of the only cats in the world. The cheetah will then, will, will, will scout They'll scout a herd of giraffe, I mean, a herd of uh, uh, zebra or impala or gazelle. They'll, they'll scout, they'll see the old, the sick, the newborn. They'll study it for two or three days. Then she'll get her cubs. The cheetah usually has two to three cubs. She keeps them with her. It could be two to four years. It's one, one of the longest in the cat family. She has to teach them how to hunt. So she'll put a little baby, a young year old cheetah here. She'll put one there and she'll put one over there. But she's sitting back over here. All of a sudden, the zebra or impala or whatever's out there eating, they go, oh, those just baby cheetahs, not knowing she's back over here. All of a sudden, she explodes. When she explodes, you're talking, what is it, Brian, zero to 50 in seconds? Four seconds, yeah. Zero to 50, 60 miles an hour. Once she hits the prey, it stuns it, but you know something? 70% of the time, the animal gets away, 70%. What happens then? The cheetah has to rest for two to three days. So now, she hasn't eaten for three days. Now she has to rest for three more days. So now she's going to hunt again, right? If that happens again, they get away, the, the babies are gone. And so will she be eventually. Because she has to rely on her speed. But let's say she does make that hit. What she does is she has a little dew claw here, but she grabs this area of the, of the, of the neck of the, of the, the, the gazelle or whatever, and then that way, then she can consume the kill. But what's wrong there? Guess what happens then? Buzzards and vultures in Africa will circle over a kill immediately, okay? Then the lions and hyenas who are sleeping all the time, they're sleeping, what happens then? They come and take the food from the cheetah. Lions have been known to even eat the cheetah. So this is the animal here, thanks to Bush Gardens and the parks, the few parks in our country that have the cheetah, with our breeding programs, this animal is starting to come back very well. One, one other thing, the tail of that cheetah is like a sail on a sailboat. When she can move, when you're going 60 miles an hour, she can move that tail, and that animal, I can't show it today, but I have a slow motion video. That animal it goes like this, right? He almost goes like this, parallel like this to the ground, and goes sideways, and you think his it, body's gonna hit the ground. That's how fast the animal moves. And I just want you to see the world's fastest land mammal, and thanks to Bush Gardens and the parks in our country, this animal is going to make it. So thank you guys for coming to Zoo and coming out all you guys. You should see this 
check in the hotel. That, <laughs> that cheetah on the leash is not too much. <laughs> I would tell you what hotel and they get upset with me probably. <laughs> These animals here will stand out here with them or however they want to film. We'll just go ahead and focus on one up here and I'll do the other one. These are one are, are the lemurs. And these are uh, a, a, a red rough lemur here at first here. And a black and white one you're seeing behind here. Well, I'll just focus on this one right now and then we can even get how you ever want to do it. The camera guys here are doing great. The lemur, everybody, is a pre -simian. Some of you are saying, oh, that's just a lemur. We've seen lemurs on TV. Well, look at it very closely because the lemur is what we call a pre -simian. And what does pre -simian mean? It means prior to monkeys and apes. Can you imagine these animals being on the planet prior to the monkeys and apes? I wouldn't even know how many thousands of years that would have been. And they don't live in Africa, everybody. They live on the island of Madagascar. Everybody says, oh, it's from Africa. The island of Madagascar, everyone, is off the coast of East Africa, out of Kenya there, way out there, about 1,000 miles of the ocean out there. It's a pretty large island. They say that about 50 to 100 years ago, who, who knows, the research back then, that there are about 60 to 70 different species of lemurs, 60 to 70. Today, as of last year, we had 24 left. Now, that has been stopped as far as the loss of the lemurs, as far as the poaching, and, and the, you can see that coat, you think that, you think that the snow leopard's coat was something, that is beyond chinchilla fur, this animal. So it was killed for that, it was killed for consumption. Remember something everybody, there are different cultures throughout the world. I hear people say quite often, not that much, but they say, that's terrible, they eat the lemur, that's terrible they poach this, that's terrible they do that. Remember folks, this has been going on, these are countries that don't have the education we have, or maybe other countries. And they're getting that education, understanding that, that they could go, they could go any day because of the consumption. So you teach them how to consume other things. Like, I know that the foundation here at SeaWorld Bush Gardens, we supply monies to all over the world. For example, there's a little turtle in South America. It may not mean much to you, but it's, it's almost gone now. So what do we do now? There's a nut that's growing on the trees over there. So now they're carving the turtle's shell out of the nut instead of taking the turtle and selling the shells. And there's many, many things we're doing like that to teach people. And that's what it's all about as far as conservation anyway, is teach people. But this animal here has been stock hunted. And they do, they're doing coming back pretty good. Uh, there's about 24 species left. That tail is magnificent. If you turn sideways, I want to see that tail a minute. If you were to go up here, everyone, I wish some of you could do this, but it's not allowed, but I usually break the law, but I won't allow it today, I guess. Uh, this thing here, if, if I, see, I know I'm looking at that, right? If I were, if I were to put that tail in my hand and I didn't have feeling, so to speak, there is no weight in the tail. It's like the, it's like a feather. And then when they get alarmed, they put their tail up. They have two little teeth on their front, in their front mouth, or their mouth here, about the pretty sharp ones. They use for breaking nuts and, and, and fruits and things. And they also make, the main thing for them is to groom. They groom all day long. Look at the little feet, if you want, the, the hands of this thing. Just like yours. I don't think you see that. See that? Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Now what you're seeing when she scratches, what they do when they scratch like that, they're all day long grooming each other, just having, just no wonder I should be a lemur when I grow up or something. I mean, it's just like, I mean, I like that too myself. He used to tell me to do that all day long. This by here, these are two largest lemurs. The smallest lemur that's alive today can fit in the palm of your hand. This one back here, we'll show it real quickly. That is the, the black and white rough lemur. And that is gorgeous, isn't it? It's almost like a skunk. But it's not a skunk. They also have, by the way, these things have scent glands under their arms here. And they mark the trees with it. And they mark the territory with their scent glands that the lemurs do. So thank you so much for bringing that from uh, beautiful SeaWorld and Joe Slavin, who does a great job with your Pets and Hawaii show here. The lemur is known to spend a lot of time on the ground as well, everybody. A lot of time on the ground they spend. Now look at this cat very closely because I can tell you now, you not only won't see this probably in about four zoos in the country, but in the wild, they now, Brian was just telling me that they think, this is, I can't believe how somebody know this, there are less than 60 left in the world in the wild. 60, not 600. Uh, I doubt that very seriously. I just told you about the tiger, how far off we were. This is a moor leopard from, you know, from uh, like, Russia, that part of the world, called the Amur, A-M-U-R. Look it up when you go home if you want to. But if you can take, take pictures, by the way, it doesn't bother me if you want to take a picture. But you can also look it up. Look at the coat on that animal. Is that spectacular? That's unbelievable. Now you say that's like maybe that a spotted leopard. No, it's a, it's a, it's a much different cat, a, a sturdier looking cat. A leopard is a much thinner cat. However, I've seen a leopard take up a little, uh, a little, an antelope. A leopard might weigh 150, 175 pounds. Big ones maybe 200, but more than likely 150 pounds. A leopard can make a kill of a gazelle or uh, impala, which might weigh two or three hundred pounds, and pull that animal up in a tree like it's a marshmallow. These animals obviously are mainly nocturnal, hunt at nighttime. The Amur leopard, that coat there, you thought the snow leopard, I keep, because I'm just, can't, I know you can't touch the coat, but that coat there is even twice as soft as that beautiful snow leopard. 
Whereas remember I told you all the other cats coach are very, very coarse. Isn't that amazing? Just absolutely spectacular. Yes, it was hunted for its coat back in the days, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. But today, that's gone. For example, a pelt on the black market today, this cat, a pelt of this cat, the snow leopard pelt, they got a guy several years ago that was selling a, a snow leopard pelt from 20 years to 15 years back for $60,000, one cat. This is probably well over $100,000 if, if you can find one, which is not done anymore because people know what they're going to do with it. Nothing. And so it's an animal that is nocturnal again. Their eyesight is beyond spectacular. Ours, you know, six times greater than ours at nighttime. And they're mainly a solitary cat as well. So I wanted to bring you the Elmore Leopard because more than likely that'll be the last Elmore Leopard. I say last one we'll have. I'm not saying they're going to go extinct in the wild. I am saying in the zoological world, we do very well breeding them. So there's that chance again that they'll go back out there in the wild if it doesn't eat Brian first. <laughs> have fun, Brian. <laughs> if you don't see Brian again in the show, you know why. Uh, round of applause for the beautiful Elmore Leopard there. I, I obviously love elephants, I love cats, I love whales, I love dolphins, I love everything, but the cats are some incredible animal, all the cats throughout the world. All your spotted cats, by the way, all your spotted cats are basically endangered throughout the world right now. This right here, everyone, this, no matter how many times I see this, maybe you're not there, I was in the service during the Vietnam War, what I'm saying to you is, when I see the American bald eagle, I get chills, and I get it right now. We have, have to be very lucky to have a little home out in Montana near Glacier Park on a lake there. And every morning, you put your clock to it. Eight o'clock, that bald eagle flies over that lake right in front of us. And I, I sit there and I visit her. I go, oh, God, it's bald eagle. The guy visiting me goes, and my buddy goes, and whoever it is, he goes, oh, my gosh, Jack, it's just a bald eagle. Don't we see bald eagles in Florida. I don't care where you see them. But you guys, adults, know. You kids may not know. Look at it very closely, everyone, because that animal came with it that close to going extinct in our country. That close. But guess what happens now? When you have the monies, and I never got into this, the monies that this park gives to rehab, we all know it, you've been reading some about it, but it's there, it's in the records. They don't brag about it, they talk to you about it, you just saw it on the video here, but I know what they spent. I know what they spent on JJ the killer whale, I mean, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the whale out in uh, San Diego that was beached at about uh, 30 feet as a youngster, they kept it for a year, the thing was from that end of the stage down to here, the largest release of any wild animal in the world, and I've been on many of the releases, and one last thing in history. History will show everybody. Thanks to SeaWorld who started the rescue and rehabilitation of the manatee. You better look at when history, when I'm gone here 30 years from now, you will see what they've done to save the manatee. You know how many you lost this year in Florida? Some of you know about, right? Over 700. You can't lose a species when they're about 3,700 a year. It ain't going to work. And so they taught us in Columbus Zoo, modeled ours after them for rehab. There's about five of us in the country that do it. These bald eagles here, a lot of them are injured. A lot of them are going to they hit power lines. That's one of the main faults with it. This is a young one over here. I don't know how old this one is. 11 months old. It, it, yeah, that's a baby. You know how quick they grow? You see that right there? They're hatched sometime around March, April, depending on what part of our country. This, this, this animal here is hatched. And I think I'm right about this. About 10 to 12 weeks to that big. It's amazing to watch this bird grow. You see the white head and tail? This is perfect. I've, I've never done this before here. I always saw that, but not a young one. Do you see the white head and tail? That's about three to four years before it gets a white head and tail. One of the problems we have with the bald eagle, not much anymore, but we did 10 years ago, these animals were getting shot. Not because somebody's out there to kill a bald eagle. It could be buzzards. Some people that have ranches and farms out west, they don't know what it is. They've got chickens and stuff out there they're trying to live off of, and they pot shot them. Well, now they've been educated, the folks, even in their own country, that that is a young, our national bird. If you look at the talons on either one of these birds, I don't know which one they're focused on, the feet there. See that right there? Now, even the Alaskan bald eagle, everybody, is bigger than that. If she did not have that glove on, and that eagle were to come down on her arm, by the way, it would not do this, but if it did, it came down on her arm and go through her skin, through her muscle, and take her bone apart in one split second. That's a thousand pounds of pressure per square inch on that talon right there. Yes, the smaller birds of prey have the pressure, like an owl and stuff, but not that kind of pressure. Their eyesight, I wouldn't even measure their eyesight. Now, another thing about the bald eagle, all of you, most birds of prey, by the way, eat something alive. The bald eagle can be like a vulture. They're not a lazy bird, but they will eat carrion, dead things. They'll go and get, pick up fish off the top of the lake. But it's spectacular to watch them catch a fish as well. But most of the time, they'll eat something that's already gone, the bald eagles. Again, thank you, SeaWorld, again, for making a difference in all of our lives and bringing us. Maybe some of your kids have seen a lot of I don't know. But kids, that is what America represents, this thing right here, the bald eagle. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
and you, oh, you have the largest eagle's nest in the world. You know that Alamont Springs, I think. I don't know if it's still there, side of the Volkswagen. What in the world? <laughs> you know what? I did not know this until about 10 minutes before the show. These are, these are actually um, giraffes. <laughs> That's a camel, I think. Anyway, Joe Slavin, you saw the Christmas show here some of you, correct? Well, I'm gonna tell you something. That show is spectacular. C-Roll, Joe Slavin, who helps put these shows, yes. By the way, he's the most humble. Joe, would you raise your hand? Probably considered one of the finest animal trainers in the world today. I love the folks here at C-Roll, obviously. And when you see Pets Ahoy real quickly, you realize what he's told you. Hey, 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 those, hey, man, I, I just paid for those things. <laughs> anyway, that's a camel. Um, the camel, everybody, is a beast of burden. Some of the first animals in the world that people took their goods across in the, in the Middle East, all over the place over there. But now there are more camels in Australia than in the Middle East, more camels in Northern Africa than in the Middle East. It's amazing. That is a dromedary camel. How do y'all know that? A dromedary is a D, right? Just D, that means one hump, dromedary. Factoring camels? which is we have in the wilds, and some people have them. They're from Mon uh, uh, Mongolia, they live in the mountains. The camel, look at it closely. This animal is built for survival. If you have a camel in certain parts of Africa where I've been, that's like having a home and a car and everything you need. Why is that? That's transportation, everyone, beyond comprehension. That's an animal you can go for several weeks without even drinking water. It's not water in the hump, it's storage of fat, and also that's where it gets its nourishment from. The camel's eyelid has two eyelids, so in a dust storm, they can shut those eyes. Look at the ears. There basically are no ears. None of you have been in a dust storm before. Let me tell you, that sand is like bullets. It can go right, it can put, get into your skin. That's how fast it's going, you know, go 50 to 100 miles an hour. So this animal is built all for that to avoid it. The, the, uh, the fur, let's say, let's say those guys go two or three months across the desert, right? They have everything they need. Some camp, if you know this or not, but camels, camels are used as a food source in many parts of the world. So if they're going there and something happens, they can't get across. They, this is terrible. I got four shows here. I'm not going to Anyway. No, no, no. Go back over there. No, no. Don't go back here anymore. Watch out. No, go that way, buddy. Anyway. So the camel is a food source as well as the fur used for clothing. The animal's feet go into the sand. And also the bones are used for tools and weapons. And the milk of the camel and survival. And the defecation of the camel is kept in a little sack like you used to make when I was a boy in Tennessee. Make cottage cheese. Like a, a breathe-through sack. They keep it down there. And over a, a, a five days, six day period dries up. And that's how they cook their food. Everything is with this animal. If you have 30, 40 camels going across the desert. So I want to end the show today by thanking SeaWorld for the great job they do of educating not just you folks, but me every time I come here. And God bless SeaWorld and all their parks. And God bless all you and all your families and Don's family. God bless you especially. Thank you, everybody. Have a great